The Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. That's, uh, you know, me kind of doing a very light take on the version of Batman I was raised by, you know, which is sort of post Neil Adams' take, which he was doing the year I was born. Um, Neil Adams was redefining the character kind of in the cracks and corners of DC when he was first a cover artist on a lot of the uh, Batman books in the late 60s and then once they gave him sort of the run of the place um, his look he kind of exaggerated even more with the uh, the lighting and the grandeur the way he would exaggerate the figure form the length of the ears the um, the length of the cape, um, a lot of it was just sort of aesthetics. He wasn't really changing the costume per se. I tried to illustrate what Adams did with a sense of maybe somewhat photo exacting kind of take on it, while also kind of avoiding some of the comic book tropes of the glowing white eyes, which I was always having a problem with as a kid, thinking about like how the mask is pretty much on his face like it's makeup. Like it's as close to the skin as you can get the way it was drawn by everybody, Adams included. And if that's the case, there's no room to hide the eyelashes for the human being wearing this mask. So basically just his natural eyes showing, but you can hide that in shadow. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show, and more, because we are uh, really talking comics tonight, or maybe a little bit. John Suntress here. Always happy to welcome pop culture author and editor Matthew Clickstein. Good to see you, Matt. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on the show. As always, man. No, no, no. I'm always happy when you got something interesting to talk about. It's Halloween season, and uh, you know, I think you're kind of kicking off my uh, my Halloween coverage with uh, one of the subjects we'll talk about tonight. And that is uh, the great Lloyd Kaufman and uh, Troma Films. And uh, tell me, tell me what you're uh, what you're in the midst of editing right now. Um, yes, so uh, I uh, was able to speak with University Press of Mississippi. Uh, they are considered one of the great pop culture history publishers uh, in general, but particularly in the academic university press world. Um, and they do uh, these three series of great books that I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with. Um, there's the Conversations with Filmmaker series that's been going on for 25 years, and then Conversations with Comic Book Creators, and then Conversations with Writers and Authors. Um, this book that I'm uh, just finishing up now, I just turned in the first draft, uh, is part of the Conversations with Filmmakers series. Um, and they've done installments on everyone from John Ford to John Waters to Steven Spielberg to Cronenberg, David Lynch, Lars von Trier, everyone and anyone you can imagine. It's been 25 years of it, Quentin Tarantino. Um, and I noticed that they hadn't done one on Lloyd Kaufman. I was a fan of the series. I'd actually just read a new one on the Iranian filmmaker Jafar Panahi. And uh, I was really blown away by the interviews that the editor found and annotated and, and uh, edited Drew Todd. Uh, and I said, you know, I would love to do something like this. I'm a fan of the series. Uh, I noticed they hadn't done one on Lloyd. Uh, I got in touch with an editor over there uh, just by looking into Drew Todd's uh, acknowledgments in the Jafar Panahi book and said, oh, I'll just look some of these people up. And I did and got in touch with a few of them. And uh, they decided to let me have a shot after I convinced them. At first, in, in all fairness, and anyone who's familiar with Troma and Lloyd Kaufman um, might uh, kind of chuckle at this, but uh, the reality is at first they weren't really sure if they wanted to do an installment on <laughs> Lloyd Kaufman, uh, which I think is actually kind of nuts because, you know, not only has he had such an indelible impact 
on filmmaking over the last 50 years. And he's had so many protégés like Eli Roth and James Gunn, obviously, is a big one, and Trey Parker and Matt Stone of South Park. Um, but uh, he's done so much more, and we can talk about that a little bit and we get into that in the book that I did. And not to mention the fact that I love Stuart Gordon. Stuart Gordon's great too, too but they did a Stuart Gordon installment. I didn't know that. Wow. If you're gonna do, yeah, do Stuart Gordon, come on, you could do Lloyd Kaufman. I mean, let, let's be honest here. Uh, so the point is, um, I was able to convince them to let me do it. Uh, so the book will be coming out at some point. Uh, it's going to be called Lloyd Kaufman colon interviews, Lloyd Kaufman interviews through University Press in Mississippi. Um, and really, I, yeah, I'm, I'm being credited as an editor as opposed to an author. It was my charge to track down um, articles uh, with Lloyd, you know, conversations with him, mainly Q&As um, over the years, his entire career, which is, spans more than 50 years now. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I had to figure out who owned them because it's not always just the author, of course, especially when you're dealing with big publications. I had to track those people down. I had to work out licensing deals with them. It's a university press, so we don't have a very large budget. Um, and uh, I did annotate, I fact-checked, I edited a little bit, uh, as well as an introduction of my own. Um, it's supposed to be 3,500 words. Right now it's about 6,000 because I have a lot to say, obviously, about Lloyd Coffin. But, and I tend to, as you know, John, and a lot of your listeners are familiar with me, I can be very garrulous. But um, so I'll have the introduction and then a chronology that I put together, a filmography and a few other little things. But basically, it's a collection of interviews that other people have done with Lloyd going all the way back to the early 80s. And we have people like Jack Matthews in there and Chris Gore of Film Threat um, sure. and all different kinds of folks, people from the AV Club, The Ringer, um, but also publications from other countries as well as someone did a thesis about trauma, I was able to get an interview he did with Lloyd for that. And even uh, for the very first time, uh, anyone's gonna hear it who wasn't there, um, the full uh, transcription of Lloyd's uh, retort, he was actually roasted at San Diego Comic-Con in 2009. And uh, he had a very interesting panel on there, including a longtime lifelong friend, Stan Lee, um, and a few other folks on there. Tim Seeley was there. Um, and a few others, uh, Penelope Spiris did some stuff, I think through video and, and that kind of thing. There are all these different filmmakers and folks there and we have Lloyd's and we have permission to use it, Lloyd's retort, uh, which was kind of <laughs> fun as well. So, and <laughs> so it's a real variety of different, it's not just uh, Q and A articles, it's all different kinds of material, letter he wrote to the AFMA um, and all different kinds of things that really showcase who Lloyd is. And as we said earlier, John, and we can get into more during this, uh, little show here, um, Lloyd is trauma and trauma is Lloyd. Uh, it really is, he's one and the same and he would say the same thing, uh, even though he does have a lifelong partner at it and he's had so many people work with him over the years, but Lloyd is trauma, trauma is Lloyd. <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, by the way, Jonathan already very excited to read the book. Uh, University oh. Press, Jonathan, so. I know Jonathan, yeah, he's a good guy. I actually just hooked him up. He does a great podcast that everyone should check out also called Amusing Jews. Uh, in fact, they just took them up. Ah. Lloyd could be on it, but it's a great podcast. Yeah, and and Jonathan's a professor and does a, a really funny podcast called Amusing Jews. Good and to actually, hear. Robin's on as we speak, or very soon, actually. So he he gets all different kinds of folks on. That's uh, who. who uh, forgive me, I was talking over you. Who's he got coming up? Uh, Trina Robbins is going to oh, be okay, next. Oh, Oh my God, we love yeah, Trina. Yeah. A lot of people might not know this, but Trina is Jewish. So <laughs> okay, yeah. No, she's she's a oh, what a sweetheart. And what a, what an important independent voice in comedy she really that she's been. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. You know, I talked to Drew Friedman a few months ago, mm. and he had his underground comic book um, portraits uh, recently yeah. and had a great, beautiful early Trina uh, drawing that he did and everything. Yeah, so no, she's – man, it's been a long time since I've seen her and uh, Lee – or St uh, Steve Ray there, Lee Aloha. Yeah, uh, Steve Ray yeah, they were chilling in some lobby, and I, I, I sat down and just they are getting around. They really are. Yeah, in fact, Trina's going to be the the guest of honor at uh, Juice uh, J E W C E happening in New York. It's the they've revitalized the Jewish Comic Con, which had been going on in Brooklyn some years ago. Yes, the theme over at the Jewish Cultural Center in New York. They're going to be doing it literally, I think, in two weeks or so. That's um, great. I was going to go, but it just didn't work out. I'll probably go next year. We, we, you know, we very well might end up doing something even with Lloyd and kind of a trauma thing. Lloyd's Jewish too, maybe with, you know, sort of an offshoot of that. So we've been talking about the, the folks are putting it on in about two weeks. It's called juice. It's a one day thing. I think November 12th, but people can look it up. 
Um, and there'll be all different kinds of folks there, but Trina is going to be the guest of honor, actually. So that'll be pretty cool. And then Trina and Lloyd are uh, voices in uh, uh, See You at San Diego, your fantastic book on the history of Comic-Con. They are, yeah. I, um, For those who might not know, I did an oral history of San Diego Comic-Con, really the entire fandom scene at large. In fact, it goes all the way back to the 1930s, years before Comic-Con even started. Um, and it's really the history of pop culture and fandom itself through the lens of kind of the prehistory uh, history and, uh, you know, the, the spread and moving on of, of Comic-Con. Um, as a community more than as an institution. And uh, we spoke to over 50 people, but I did end up talking to Lloyd Kaufman and I did talk to Trina Robbins and there's tons of pictures in the book of Trina. And actually Lloyd's team got us some great photos of Lloyd with different people or even other folks in there like James Gunn, John Landis, all these different folks who were at Comic-Con or other conventions. Uh, so they were both very, very helpful. And Trina has been great. We've actually done a number of events together uh, to promote the book. Uh, so um, Trina's another one of those where where the hell is her documentary? Why is there not a documentary on Trina Roth? Like, oh my goodness, she was the first female underground comics creator, first and foremost. I mean, that alone, let alone she is the Trina that Joni Mitchell is singing about in Ladies of the Canyon. She hung out with that whole uh, Laurel Canyon scene back in the day with Neil Young and everybody. She dated Harlan Ellison. She was doing stuff on the West Coast, and she went over the East Coast. She was doing stuff. She had her own fashion line. She did stuff for Mamas and the Papa. She did stuff for Donovan. She dressed all these people. Uh, you know, she did every possible thing you can do. And, you know, aside from people like you and I, John, and, and other scholars and folks that are really in the scene, a lot of people probably wouldn't even know who Trina is, which is really a shame because she's such an important figure. It, comic books, science fiction, fashion, rock and roll. I mean, I just said it. And, you know, a lot of people probably wouldn't know who she is. And that's really, really a shame. You know, I'm kicking myself, Matthew, because uh, I'm going to have to make you uh, put me in contact with her and get her on uh, Word Balloon. Yeah, yeah, we should definitely have her on the show. Yeah, she's oh my God. Yeah, she's, yeah. yeah, she's hilarious. She remembers everything. Oh, yeah. She's into her 80s now. She's this adorable little old lady. I love her to death with her big glasses. Yes. And, uh, and people would recognize, you know, she's been in so she's been in a lot of different documentaries about comic people. Uh, you know, uh, probably a lot of folks remember the documentary about R. Crumb. Crumb, she's one of the great voices in that movie. And what's great about her, what's great about Trina and Crumb that I love is she kind of it vacillates between loving him as a person, loving him as an artist, loving him as an inspiration, even for herself but also having uh, you know, her nuanced critique about him and some of his later work and other aspects about him. And so I really appreciated that as forthright and uh, outspoken and even a little political as Trina can be, um, and even some of her earlier work, she's able to be very nuanced and um, even bicameral in a lot of ways, as far as she can appreciate and respect something, but also still have some critiques for it. Uh, sure. that are very sound so without without getting too angry or too uh you know galvanized i i think that that's something that's great about trina that she can have such a powerful voice but kind of see all sides of a topic even something that's as complex as you know are you for or against our crumb you know which is a tough one for a lot of people sure <laughs> absolutely no you're right about that no she's incredible lloyd is incredible as well we'll bring it back to lloyd because uh, I, I am excited to read this. You mentioned that uh, not only are you uh, do, have you called interviews and Q and A's of domestic things, but also international things. Um, how is uh, Lloyd? How are I should say Lloyd and Trona, Troma regarded uh, internationally? You know, it depends on where you go, of course. But Lloyd is the king of he, he's the ultimate and maybe one of the last, if not the last, of the great carnival barker showman type. Um, you know, he kind of brings together the the crazy Eddie used car salesman with Henny Youngman. Um, and you could just see him and, and folks who might not even necessarily know his name uh, would would if they're into pop culture and especially film and horror film and, and aspects like this. Um, they probably recognize it just because, yeah, he's so recognizable. He is the face of trauma and he's got his bow tie and he's got his tweed jacket or his striped jackets or whatever it is. Although lately he's been wearing a Tupac sweater. So, uh, you know, he, he's always <laughs> crazy too with changing with the times. But the point <laughs> is uh, he really gets out there. And even now, now that he is getting near, uh, you know, his 80th year as well, yeah. uh, he goes everywhere. He goes to all these festivals. He'll, he'll go just about anywhere at the drop of a hat as long as you're willing to pay his bills and get him out there because he loves his fans. 
He loves the trauma community. He loves spreading the word and the gospel of trauma. And really what he's doing as a true independent filmmaker uh, across the board, as far as just gaining the financing, getting the production, getting the crew, uh, even even most of the channels, if not all of them, in m- many cases of distribution and exhibition. I mean, he is so vin- uh, vertically integrated. He was really one of the people who pioneered that. Um, it's been said, and it's probably at this point true, he is probably the longest running in history independent film studio. Because even some of the bigger ones like United Artists with Chaplin and Griffith and folks and uh, and that whole gang over there, and just some of the other ones that were happening in the 60s and 70s over the years, um, the folks that were doing Easy Rider and movies like that, uh, you know, they were at most maybe around for 10 years. And then, you know, they would fall apart or move on, um, you know, all the all the different independent studios in the, the 80s and early 90s, like New Line and Fine Line and all the different, you know, Paramount Classics and all that. You know, a lot of these kind of came and went. But Lloyd is still around. Troma is still around. They started in 1974. They're still going strong. So he's pushing that as well. And wherever he's going, Australia or Japan or Spain or all over Europe or all over Central America or Canada, um, he is not just pushing himself and his films, but Troma as kind of a movement and a community idea, uh, but also what it takes to be a true independent filmmaker who is moored to nothing and who is shackled to nothing and inhibited by nothing um, except his own, what he thinks is going to work or not work. Um, And, you know, obviously he takes some advice, hopefully sometimes uh, from his lovely wife, Pat. So, uh, you know, she even reads his scripts and everything else. Um, She was actually the film commissioner. She was the New York film commissioner for a number of years too, by the way. So they were an interesting power couple in their own little Yeah, my God, that's amazing. So yeah, so Lloyd is, is definitely respect in a lot of other countries simply by matter of he goes out there and he's really pushing it and promoting it. Plus not to mention the fact that so many of his films are so iconic that even if you don't necessarily understand what's going on, you know who the toxic Avenger is and Sergeant Kabuki man and some of these other characters that have become so incredibly ubiquitous. Um, You know, sometimes the humor because his films are not just straight horror, they tend to really combine different okay. genres like humor or even musical um so the humor sometimes might not translate in other places what's funny here might not necessarily be funny in japan but there are certain aspects of the films and just how stylized they are how sweet generous they are they're very unique and singular to themselves the trauma movie is a trauma movie even they're not all directed by lloyd of course uh, but you can always tell when you're watching a trauma movie they all have a certain aesthetic quality Um, You know, the DIY punk thing would tend to be genre bending as far as horror and comedy, a lot of Splatterfest stuff, a lot of Herschel Gordon Lewis type of stuff going on, Uh, brightly colored, very vitriolic, very frenetic, fast moving, very energetic. I mean, all of the different trauma films have uh, an energy that is like a freight train and it's relentless. I mean, it's sometimes overstimulating to people. Um, (laughs) That is a trauma film and really what makes something trauma. Um, immediately, especially uh, film buffs and B-movie film buffs might compare the trauma output to filmmaker producers like Roger Corman. Um, you know, are they are are they cool with each other? Is there any sort of rivalry or anything? No. You know what's funny is a lot of those filmmakers from that scene, Herschel Gordon Lewis, I would even throw in at least in the earlier years, John Waters, the Cooker Brothers, um, Roger Corman, Russ Meyer. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, Russ Meyer is obviously a big one. Um, sure. A lot of people might not be as familiar with someone like Herschel Gordon Lewis, but he really created in a lot of ways gore, even more so than some of the others, just because of the way that he was kind of combining um, the gory violence and the really over the top using meat for for flesh. And um, even when his films weren't necessarily as funny, they were they can still be very humorous because he's so over the top with the yeah blood. the extremeness yeah and the, and, the, and the, it's it's it becomes cartoonish in a way and certainly a movie like Wizard of Gore we're still talking about Herschel Gordon Lewis there I mean there's little moments where they're breaking the fourth wall and and the characters are talking to the camera so he always had a certain playfulness to a lot of the, his films um, but yeah a lot of those guys they were somewhat at least somewhat friendly with each other they would sometimes inspire each other you know they would see each other out on the circus circuit it was a bit of a circus too but it seems like they were all pretty good with each other and lloyd has always said that he really looked up to roger corman 
um, simply by matter of being able to watch Corman's films and say it was an, it was that idea of I can do that too. You can make a you know not not the best movie you've ever seen. Clearly, those movies are shoddily produced and low budgets, and you can tell they're shot in a couple of days and whatever. Um, but they are decent movies. They work for the most part. They have yeah. character development. They have story development. Um, and let's be honest, Corman, like Lloyd later on, really brought out, you know, this whole new generation of filmmakers, Ron Howard, Martin Scorsese, um, you know, or Joe actors. Dante. Like, what's that? Joe Dante. Also Joe Dante, Corman. big one, big yeah. one. Or, or even, you know, uh, Jonathan Demme. Jonathan um, Demme, definitely. Uh, or, or very important actors like Jack Nicholson really comes from the Roger Corman world. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a reason so many of these different talented people, Dick Miller, uh, yeah. really come together with Roger Corman. Um, and even though his films might have been a little bit slipshod just because of the low budgets and whatnot, they still are pretty decent. Lloyd saw that, was inspired by it, and really said, OK, um, I'm not necessarily going to make the kinds of movies he's, he's making. No. Um, I might have some some issues with certain aspects of them, but I'm really excited that someone's making movies like this clearly low budget, like no budget even, and it's, and it's still getting it out there. So that was what really inspired Lloyd. And they actually did meet at one point at a Tokyo International Film Festival when they were both being feted with some kind of a Lifetime Achievement Award or something. So they've met, they've talked, he's, he's talked and met with, with Roger a few other times. There, there's some interviews of them together at other festivals over the years. Um, you know, as low budget, no budget as Roger and Lloyd were, they would still go to some pretty prestigious film uh, festivals like Cannes, believe it or not. Lloyd's actually been to Cannes with his films since early on. I mean, Lloyd was a staple almost at Cannes uh, until they basically got kicked out. Um, but um, uh, yeah, no, uh, you know, so so they they, they kind of circled each other and definitely were friendly. Um, and Roger actually even had a lot of great things to say in some of Lloyd's books that he's written and had published over the years that are all about independent filmmaking. Uh, in fact, aside from everything I know about filmmaking, I learned from the Toxic Avenger, all of his other books have a similar title, like make your own damn movie, sell your own damn movie, produce your own damn movie, direct your own damn movie. And he does a, a lecture tour as well, you know, the make your own damn movie lecture tour, where basically he's saying, look, stop waiting for someone else to make your film. Stop waiting to do something with the studio. Stop waiting for that big actor or that big director or that big this, that or the other just go and make a movie right now. And here's some ways of making it a little bit easier and how you can actually do it and sell it and market it and get it out there. Because Lloyd has proven time and time again, that that is possible. Um, and he yeah. Go. Guerrilla filmmaking has gotten there. I'm going to, with my, you'll forgive me everyone with my background, but now guerrilla filmmaking is that much easier because of your phone. Yeah. Because of the phone. And, and you have a high quality camera on your phone and uh, there's a lot of free uh, editing uh, software out there. So it can be done. And uh, God, you know, again, Lloyd, like Roger, are from the eras of, you know, having to rent cameras and things yeah. like that. And now it's that much easier. Hell, uh, Word Balloon is a perfect example of you don't need a broadcast studio to uh, do podcasting or video casting as we're doing right now. So no, yeah. I absolutely respect the DIY filmmakers. And it's good to hear that uh, Lloyd and Roger have a you know have a friendly uh, relationship and appreciate each other. That's great. Sure, sure. I have uh, you you briefly you know touched on, but I really wanted to hit filmmakers. But I do have a list from Wikipedia of the various filmmakers and uh, actors that have uh, done trauma films. Oliver Stone uh, back in seventy uh, one made his debut as an actor. Paul Sorvino, Vanna White, of course Kevin Costner in Sizzle Beach, USA. Yeah, yeah. J.J. Uh, Abrams, Vincent D'Onofrio, Marissa Tomei, Michael J. White, uh, Billy Bob Thornton, Samuel L. Jackson back in 1990, Trey Parker and Matt Stone we mentioned before, uh, who did Cannibal the Musical, uh, David Boreanaz, Angel, and of course, uh, God, now I'm blanking, uh, of course, uh, Bones and uh, Seal Team Six, James Gunn, and uh, Carmen Electra among uh, the vets of uh, trauma films. So, yeah, and there's, there's, there's plenty more. In fact, when I was working on this book, um, I was watching uh, and re-watching a lot of old trauma movies. Um, some of them I'm very familiar with, like Mother's Day. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, it was actually written and directed by Lloyd's brother, Charles, who now runs a bakery in San Diego that's very successful. In fact, a lot of people go to San Diego Comic-Con, go to Charles' bakery, probably don't even know he's Lloyd Kaufman's brother, or that he made multiple trauma movies, actually, back in the day. Now he makes bread and, and pastries and whatnot. But... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so uh, I was going back through and watching a lot of these uh, movies, and I was watching the credits, and every now and then I would see more and more names of actors, um, behind-the-scenes crew, editors, sound people. I mean, there yeah. were times where just like, wow, he worked on a trauma film, and wow, that person wor worked on a trauma film. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely quite a list that's gotten bandied about, but there's, there's, there's so many more that people wouldn't even realize or know, or just who are PAs or whatever it was, um, going all the way back to, I mean, Lloyd was, Lloyd's been making feature films since 1969, at least. I mean, he was even, uh, working on his very first one, which was kind of a feature film, kind of a long short film, The Girl Who Returned the one that came out in 69, when he was still basically in school uh, in, in, at Yale, actually. He actually went to Yale, believe it or not, um, and uh, was good. For, that's actually where he met Oliver Stone. They, well, got friendlier with him. They actually grew up together. Uh, they, they, were, they were kind of kids together, yeah. So they kind of knew each other from the neighborhood, but um, they really got a lot closer in at Yale. And the way Lloyd tells it, uh, which you do sometimes have to take some stuff that Lloyd says with a bit of a grain of salt. He's a bit of a P.T. Barnum, uh, Andy Warhol type of, of uh, interviewee. Uh, and, and the way that he tells stories or Fellini, you know, with his uh, great documentary, uh, I'm a Born Liar, that idea of these filmmakers who uh, sometimes they, can't themselves. they have what David Mamet would call a gift for fiction. Uh, so you can't always take everything Lloyd says with a grain of salt. But I do know that, they, that Oliver Stone and Lloyd uh, really came up together. And the way that Lloyd tells it is uh, Oliver was trying to write novels and it wasn't until he met Lloyd uh, at Yale uh, or, or saw what Lloyd was doing at Yale that uh, he said, oh, maybe I might want to do films. And he was in some of Lloyd's films and in fact helped to produce uh, some projects that Lloyd worked on early on. And that was really Oliver Stone's entryway into filmmaking. Um, and then they kind of went their separate ways. Um, but uh, no, Oliver Stone is definitely very impacted by Lloyd, and um, uh, and so that's that's something that would probably surprise a lot of people. But true story. So. Did Lloyd uh, work with other filmmakers prior to making his own movies? Yes, um, he met a couple of guys at Yale. He never was really that interested in film when he was younger. Uh, he was a big reader. He loved classical music. He loved uh, Broadway. He was really into musicals and Broadway, very much like Mel Brooks, actually. Mel Brooks had a similar background of really was enthralled by musicals and these big Broadway shows. And sure. like, like uh, Mel and some of the other people, Lloyd is, of course, a, a born New Yorker. Uh, he kind of came from the upper uh, you know, echelon, though. His dad was a very prominent lawyer. Uh, so he had more of the kind of upper class Manhattan uh, situation. Uh, going on, but he was able to see all these big shows and whatnot. It, but it's not until he gets to Yale and he meets these fellows who are doing this Yale Film Society, um, Robert Edelston and um, another gentleman whose name I can't quite recall, that Lloyd starts watching these movies through the film series that these two uh, fellow students are doing through the Yale Film Society. And Lloyd becomes completely omnivorous. I mean, he is eating up everything that they show. He basically puts himself through a kind of ad hoc film school. And what's funny, another thing that would surprise people, he was not majoring in writing or art or anything like that at Yale. He was majoring in Chinese studies, actually. Wow. He really just wanted to get a sense of the world outside of Western culture and his kind of upbringing, you know, in the, in the upper echelon of, of Manhattan. So he wanted to do something very different. So he was majoring in Chinese studies. But at Yale, he's watching all these films. He's falling in love with them. And he's really learning the history of film through watching all these movies through the Yale Film Society. And he helped uh, uh, Robert Edelstein um, with a film that he was making um, and a few other projects. And then the earlier years also, um, he was working on some films, a movie called Sugar Cookies uh, that Oliver Stone also helped on and a couple of others that were kind of these smaller features and some shorts and the like. Um, but that, but then, you know, after that, he really gets into his own filmmaking to pay the bills pretty early on though, of trauma, even well into the early eighties, he would do, um, you know, production coordinating work and budgeting and things like that on other people's films and some pretty big ones, actually. Um, again, you might, you might surprise you to know this, but he found John Travolta's bedroom in Saturday Night Fever, as well as the discotheque that they used on that. He found the stairs that uh, Sylvester Stallone runs up in Philadelphia in Rocky. That was, wow. that, was, that was found by Lloyd and locked down by Lloyd. Lloyd was brought on because people knew in the New York film scene in particular that there was this new young kid who was coming up who knew even back then how to make movies easily, 
cheaply. And Lloyd almost in a way kind of liked all of the problem solving of dealing with the budgets and the locations and the this and that. You can watch Louis Malls, My Dinner with Andre, and the most non-trauma film anybody could ever imagine. And Lloyd is listed as the production coordinator and trauma, because trauma had already started by then. Trauma's listed as, you know, providing production services and even a trauma logo at the very end. In a way, My Dinner with Andre, two guys sitting and talking at a, during a two-hour dinner basically in real time is a trauma film and Lloyd actually helped with that. So he was involved, um, you know, even Kirk Douglas's final countdown all over the place. Um, so he really bounced around helping other filmmakers with their, uh, their pictures because he knew how to, uh, how to hack the system even back then. Um, so that of course he's going to be this incredible, important, independent savvy filmmaker now not just creatively but on the business side and on the practical side and in the early days he would he helped out friends and other people with their films and some of them became rocky or saturday night fever or yeah. so yeah that's excellent man i um is our our trauma films is he in the streaming business when it comes to the trauma library how you know how accessible beyond renting them or, or, uh, well, God, you know, as, uh, I wonder how physical media and the decline yeah. of physical media has impacted a company like trauma that really, in a lot of ways built its reputation in the old VHS days Absolutely. and then certainly the DVD days. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they definitely were one of the first, they're, they're always ahead of the game when it comes to technology. First of all, in fact, trauma even was one of the first and not the first, uh, film studio to start distributing films through Microsoft Xbox early on. They were one of the first film studios to have a website. Rod, Roger Ebert at one point did say that Troma was the first. They definitely did it very early on, like before most people didn't even know what a website was. So Troma's always been very on the ball when it comes to new technology. They have to be because Lloyd's always figuring out ways. That's part of the hacks that I was talking about earlier. Lloyd is figure, always has to figure out a way to get new distribution and to get new markets and everything. So he's been very, very on board with that, including – um, uh, trauma was very helped by the, uh, by the VHS and home video, uh, markets, but also vice versa, because at first the studios, just like everything else, just as, as malleable as, and forward thinking as Lloyd and trauma, uh, have always been, the studios are always against all that stuff because they, they love the status quo. So people don't, might not remember this or might not realize this, but early on, uh, the studios, um, were really kind of eschewing the video market and they didn't yes. really want to deal with that. No. And so the video stores were popping up and they needed content. I mean, it was just like what would happen later with YouTube and, and whatever. And so sure. it's exactly the same thing. So not only um, did home video help Troma, but Troma really did help the home video market go because they said, sure, take all we've got. We've got hundreds of videos because they don't just produce, they distribute. That's that's mostly what their library is. I mean, Troma has hundreds, if not thousands of movies in their library because they mostly distribute. Um, and so they had tons of movies to give to the home video market and really got a lot of that stuff out there. Um, absolutely. But yes, to answer your question, I was going to say this when even when I was rewatching a lot of trauma movies, I did so very conveniently through trauma does have its own streaming service, which I highly recommend. It's called trauma. Now it's only $5 a month. Okay. Um, they will actually do something. None of the other streaming services do. This is exactly the kind of stuff that Lloyd does when, if you do it month to month, uh, at the end of the month, it will actually remind you that um, it's going to uh, uh, reaffirm. And you're, yeah, you're, you're gonna you're, you're gonna re up your membership if oh. you don't cancel. So they don't just automatically do it. They actually tell you. They give you a few days. So if you do want to get out, and you're one of those people who like, you're worried. Oh, if I get the subscription, I'm gonna forget, and then it'll just keep automatically re upping me. No, Troma's nice enough. They actually tell you, but it's only five dollars a month. And I'm not kidding. It, I think it really is thousands of movies in their library, including Lloyd was smart enough to buy up stuff early on, like Brian De Palma and Robert De Niro's first film, The Wedding Party. That's in there. Dustin wow. Hoffman's first film is in there. Um, there's all different kinds of crazy movies. Blood Sucking Freaks, which is really the first movie that got them going because they, they bought it when it was called something else, and they kind of did some marketing stuff with trauma. With that, they, they changed the name to Blood Sucking Freaks, and that really became their first big film that they were putting out but as, you know, as a distributor. Um, but Troma Now is fantastic. Just look up Troma Now. And what's great is very much like the Criterion channel. Um, it's not just the movies either. They also have interviews. They have behind the scenes. All the, all the uh, special features you get 
on the DVDs and on the box sets you get on Troma now. And that's mm-hmm. a lot of fun to watch too, including a lot of their TV stuff. So they used to do all this European TV, like kind of interstitials like Troma Cafe. Um, and of course, anybody from my generation would remember their cartoon, uh, the, the, the Toxic Crusaders, based on the Toxic Crusaders. Yeah, so they have all the episodes of that. So Troma now, even if you're people who might not be that familiar with Troma, if you are a, a, a film fan or you're interested in watching films you've maybe never heard of before, uh, get Choma now because you can just lose yourself in it. Um, and, and I've seen films that I, I never had even heard of before, but just because they're recommended or I was just flipping through and going, what is that film? I mean, there's, there's a movie called Let's Stuff Stephanie and the Incinerator. I mean, that's a movie. I have to see it just for the <laughs> title alone. Um, uh, but, you know, hey, I've been very honest this whole time, full disclosure. Not a very good movie. It's actually kind of boring, but what a great title. Um, Stuff Stephanie and the Incinerator. I mean, Rabid Grannies, that one did turn out to be pretty good. Um, I actually watched it with my girlfriend. Hi, Dominique. She's supposed to be listening, so we'll see. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, no, so we we watched Rabid Grannies together, and it was really a lot of fun. It was actually very much like Evil Dead. It should not have been called Rabid Grannies. But great, great title. It should have been called Demon Aunts because they were actually everybody's aunt, great aunts. <laughs> and they were, they were really more demons than like zombie or rabbit or whatnot. But it's actually okay. a really fun movie. I I, rec- I can recommend Rabbit Grannies. Yeah. Well, the, the whole uh, low budget, micro budget horror genre fascinates me. And like you said, trauma films are absolutely their own brand, even comparing them to people like Roger Corman. It's mm-hmm. like no, no, no. These are these are two different animals that operate in the same arena. But uh, that's great to hear. So trauma now, everybody. Uh, trauma look now, up. yeah, really. It's. I mean, again, even if you don't know anything about trauma, it, it's just such a great, uh, you know, uh, just just a great market and just this great repertoire of all these different kinds of films. And there's comedy, there's romance. They they actually have all these old black and white films. I mean, they have some pretty old films that go back to the. Uh, oh, I know that girl. Um, uh, very, very tasty whiskey, but, um, Math- Matthew's, uh, girlfriend, Whiskey LaRue <laughs> checking in, nice. uh, Whiskey, um, I should let you know that, uh, my nickname, uh, with various friends, because my last name, Suntress, is Sonny LaRue, so oh, we're, we're related in a nickname way, that's nice to meet you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so, uh, anybody who- Tell me about the black and whites that are, uh, on trauma now, that you were starting to mention. Yeah, I mean, they have, uh, you know, all different kinds of foreign films and horror films and, and oh. such that you never you would never expect to be on there. I mean, again, the fact that they have Robert De Niro and, and uh, Brian De Palma's first film, The Wedding Party, which, again, I can really highly, highly recommend. Uh, uh, De Niro and De Palma made three films together um, as their first films. They're all kind of interrelated, The Wedding Party. Hi, mom, and greetings. Um, and they, they, they're sort of a trilogy, um, but the, the very first one, the wedding party, is on Troma now. Um, and there's documentaries, and like I said, just even the interviews and such. So, and it, and I can't say it enough. It's five dollars. I mean, it's five. Just one movie. If you were to rent it on Amazon, and like anything else, some of them you can rent on Amazon. Some of them are in some other places. But if you really want, you know, the great, great deluge of trauma films. Um, then, then, then definitely pop into trauma now. Well, and that's a great price uh, to mention, especially when the news came this week that Netflix is about to raise their rates again. It's uh, you know, the whole the right. whole streaming thing, and that's why it's great to hear that uh, if you do trauma now, it's such an affordable thing. Yeah, no, it's affordable. It's easy to get in and out. Uh, you can do a free trial. I think there's free trials a lot. One of the long ones, like Shutter, I think it's like three months or something. But I mean, just just watch a few trauma films and you'll see. And some of them are not always going to be of your taste. I mean, like I said, there's so many different kinds of trauma films, obviously, especially in a, that they distribute. And even some of the films that Lloyd's made, some people might love and some people might might might, might not like some of the other ones. I mean, he's sure. even made really a variety of films. I mean, he started with um, uh, after his very, very early, super avant garde, almost Andy Warhol type films like The Girl Who Returns. Um, he uh, was making uh, these sex comedies and really kind of pioneered that as well. Movies like The First Turn On and Stuck On You and Squeeze Play, which is about a girl's softball team is playing the guy's softball team, of course. Lots of stuff in there that Lloyd has said over the years, League of Their Own has ripped them off. And I actually had not seen it before until I worked on the book. I watched it 
He's right. He's right. Wow. He's definitely League of Their Own definitely took some stuff from Squeeze. All right, Ghost of Penny, Penny Marshall, you've heard it here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Shame I'll say it right here. And anybody who's familiar with League of Their Own or, or even just remotely will know this scene. The 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 shot where Gina Davis's character, Dolly Henson, has to grab the ball and does a splits and then has a picture taken of her. That scene exactly is in Squeeze Play, like 20 years earlier. And I mean, come on. I mean, it is exactly the same shot. The girl does the same splits. There's a camera that flashes. It is taken right out of Squeeze Play. So, you know, sometimes stuff that Lloyd says, people might say is crazy. Sometimes they might say is flat out wrong. Or he does sometimes get some things incorrect, both because I think, uh, you know, he's just led a very interesting life, but uh, he also enjoys kind of storytelling. It's the John Ford thing again of, you know, if you're going to tell the legend or the truth, tell the tell the legend. Right, the I mean, legend. Fair, enough, fair enough. Again, the, it's the Fellini thing. You give it to the guy. Sure. His life is a movie. His life is a cartoon. Um, so, of course, he's going to live that way. Um, but, uh, you know, I, there are definitely times that Lloyd says stuff that is true. And then you, so there, even with me, like there were, I'd go through the interviews and I'm trying to fact check and I'm at, I wanted to allow him to say certain things cause that's part of the fun of Lloyd, but I would at least footnote sometimes and say, no, Samuel L. Jackson's first film was not a trauma movie. He'd actually been working since like the late seventies and had been in a few other movies before he was in death by temptation, uh, which was like mid to late nineties. And anyway, Knows who knows Samuel L. Jackson? I mean, he was already doing some Spike Lee movies, for goodness sake. Like, well, do the right thing, you know, he comes. yeah, and even coming to America, he's uh, the yeah, whole guy. There you go. Wow, and see the fact that he's is. in that movie for like five seconds, but yeah, there so, is. Uh, some, yeah. Sometimes you do have to take what Lloyd says uh, with a grain of salt, but there is a lot that he says that will surprise the shit out of anybody. Um, and one of them is that Lee their own definitely pulled some stuff from Squeeze Play, I mean, unquestionably. That's um, and I, I think Squeeze Play is a much better film, um, and is even you know I'll say it, Lord, say it too. I think it's it's got much a much stronger feminist message to it also. And his came out in the seventies when that was still kind of dangerous to be feminist. Oh yeah. Oh no, I yeah. I mean I, I wasn't old enough to watch it in the theaters, but I certainly remember seeing Squeeze Play on the VHS racks yeah. when I worked at Blockbuster back. There in you the go, movie. there you go. And oh, it's, no, it's actually it. James Gunn's favorite trauma film. Um, and, you know, like a lot of other trouble films, even back then, very diverse. The character who actually does the splits, she's black. Um, and there's other people from other backgrounds in that film. And throughout all of the early trauma films, even going back to the time when nobody would touch these kind of subjects, you have characters who are clearly uh, or the actors are are gay or lesbians or, you know, he has so or, you know, there's even uh, kind of inklings of what would later you know, be referred to as transgender and what I mean, Lloyd was always extremely progressive uh, in the filmmaking, the stories he told and the characters that he represented in the store, in this, in the, in the worlds that the stories were representing and even uh, the crew as well. I mean, oh, wow. Lloyd has always kind of talked about it, even on a business level, but it turned out to be a really good thing. And just the kind of guy he is because a lot of people maybe who were women or who were of the LGBT community or even black or other um, you know, minority groups like that did, you know, have a lot of trouble getting work, even people who were shooters or editors or just doing behind the scenes stuff. They were they had so much trouble getting work, especially in the studios and other places that were still very closed off to them. They would come to houses like Choma and Lloyd would always take these folks in. And, you know, you could see it in the credits and you could see it with a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and whatnot. But Lloyd's sets, both in front of and behind the camera, were extremely diverse and, you know, all different kinds of sexual orientations and genders and everything else, because, um, you know, a lot of these people couldn't get work else, elsewhere. And A, that's why a lot of even the early th trauma films actually look so good and sound so good, because he's working with great talent. People who were, you know, had to work with him because they couldn't get work anywhere else. And he even said, like, yeah, we couldn't pay them much, but I mean, at least they're, they're getting work. And nobody's getting paid on the Choma film. So it's not like I'm, you know, purposely, you know, giving somebody 50 bucks and that's it. It's like, that's all anybody's getting on this set. But they, but those people were able to hone their craft in Choma films. And then many of them did go off when the rest of the industry, you know, started following suit and saying, hey, you know, we let's open up the doors a little bit. So, uh, you know, Choma was so ahead of the game in so many different ways, aesthetically, story-wise, business-wise, as I was saying, but also even sociopolitically. And that's just the kind of guy that Lloyd is and always has been. Um, he was very, very, you know, he's basically a red diaper baby. 
Um, he has stories about his grandmother raising him in this way. You know, his family was around too, and he did come up in a very capitalist, upper crust way. And he knows that. I mean, he wouldn't deny that. He definitely had, a, you know, a limousine liberal, champagne liberal kind of upbringing in some ways. But he had his grandmother, and he very early on started reading all these different philosophy books and, um, you know, books like The Power Elite, which is really all about kind of the class system and corporate, you know, he's doing this when he's basically a kid. So this is all going in his head. And he, all of this, all of this comes out in his trauma films. I mean, look at Toxic Avenger. As goofy and silly as some people might say it is, it's saying a lot about the environment, about the ecosystem, about, conser you know, conservation, about, you know, toxic waste. These are all new topics when he was developing it in the early 80s, even when it came out in 1984. Yeah. So these are still very, very new topics that no one else is talking about. No one knows what conservation is. No one, like Earth Day was still kind of a new thing. And Lloyd goes right into it, even with this kind of silly, funny, cartoonish, goofy, you know, horror comedy movie. Um, he's still dealing with a very important topic that was extremely ahead of its time. And that's Lloyd in all of the movies that he made in many of the other trauma films, for sure. You're absolutely right, man. Hell, even... Uh... Got only a couple of years after the Toxic Adventure, we had the real horrors of uh, Chernobyl yeah. uh, and things like that. So, no, I, I hear you. Uh, and mm -hmm. also mentioning other people that got their first breaks from Lloyd, our own Tim Seeley, our good friend, uh, yeah. wrote, a, wrote a trauma film as well. well yeah. No, he, uh, Tim, did the, Tim, Tim did, Tim did the, uh, the trauma uh, comic books. He did a lot of the trauma comic books. Okay. That's really how Tim, and he's done artwork. And look, the other thing too is uh, anybody who works on any kind of trauma project, trauma film, you, you're all wearing different hats. So I'm sure uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Tim's picked up, you know, uh, a light or two or, or was also involved in some of the films. I've never really talked to him about that too much. Um, Tim, Tim's a good friend. Another one who's in uh, See You at San Diego also. Oh, yeah. But Tim, no, Tim's a great guy. And we actually met um, and the reason he's in the Comic-Con book. And he's also helped me with my career in other ways. He was one of the people who helped to connect me uh, to Aftershock uh, to get my own comic book series going. You were obsolete. A lot of that was Tim helped with that actually. Um, and, you know, he's in the Comic-Con book, which was also very helpful. Everyone really loved that Tim Seeley was in there. Um, and, you know, we did an event together in your own Chicago there, John, as well, at one of the bookstores there. So Tim's been great to me the entire way through. And I met him through a mutual trauma friend who I knew through some other people. I mean, trauma really is this community and it's this network where we're all helping each other out. There's sort of this trauma army and, and you know, it's the kind of thing like you could probably find, you know, a couch to sleep on if you're a trauma person and you, you know, you can hit up some people and be like, Hey, who are the trauma people out here? And you'll find some people. And they'll, and I've met so many other people over the years traveling around the country and going to different festivals and going to different events and whatnot. And there's always trauma people, and they have always been extreme. At first, it was sort of weird. It was sort of cultish. It was really like, even with Tim, I asked him one point, like, why are you being so nice to me? And it's and, he, and he's all about it. I mean, it really is just like, hey, man, we're all in this together. We're all freaks and misfits and weirdos and outsiders, and we do comic books and these horror films and gore and, and you know, and all this really crazy stuff and, uh, you know, like certain girlfriends of mine burlesque and everything. And, and um, you know, you, you never know. Uh, you know. And we're all just this kind of mesh of, of supernumeraries in, in the real world. And so we've created this, um, you know, this, this kind of ad hoc other world. And a big part of that is trauma and trauma is a big, uh, you know, part of it as well. Um, and uh, you know, through that, I met Tim Seeley. I mean, it really is through the trauma world. You know, I know it was kind of going around and around in circles. No, but... I I had the same shared experiences, and uh, I met Tim through comics first and foremost <laughs> through through Devils Do and Josh Blaylock and the various creators that uh, were working yeah, with Devils Do at the time. Yeah, but that sure. said, I have also met uh, people from the burlesque world and the horror yeah. world because of uh, the circles that Tim has been in. And no, I, I mean, really, uh, I've, I've always said to that group of comic creators that included Tim, I really felt a kinship with them when I was starting Word Balloon and they were cutting their teeth on their first comics. And it's like, like you said, man, it's like, no, we're all in this together. And that is the kind of relationship I still have with Tim to this date. So, uh, in fact, I told him that we're talking and, I, and he says hello. And oh, so yeah. No, I, I think I, I think I mentioned it to Tim as well. We were we're pretty good buddies at this point and uh, he's always good to consult with. Um, and he's, he's so generous with his uh, knowledge and with the wisdom that he's gained over the years and all the skills. And I mean, Tim's another one of those guys kind of like Lloyd where he's worked with the biggest of the bigs and he's worked with the smallest of the smalls. 
And, um, you know, even in the way that he can pass the torch to the next generation while he's still doing what he's doing, I'm, I'm sure a lot of your listeners and you know that he just handed over Hackslash over to Zoe Thorgood, um, you know, the, the, the young Vonderkind who did, um, you know, a Loneliness in the Center of the World, uh, at Center of the Earth, and, um, you know, all, all these other projects that she's done. Um, you know, even though she's what, what is she, 16 or something? She's like a kid. She's oh, I didn't know she was that young. Wow. Okay. Yeah, no, she's young. She's like 23, though. But oh, okay. No. But still, and, no. And again, he just, just handed over hack slash to her to do. And part of it is not just to help this next generation of uh, comic creators go and comic writers go, but also because he said, you know, the character ha it, it has been around for so long now, it's time to have. First of all, you know, have, have it be a, a young woman since the character is a young woman, but also, you know, someone who's going to know this younger generation. So yeah, absolutely. Of that age and so forth. So he's really, so Tim is so generous about that. And this is, and I know that Hack Slash was such an important title for him and something that really meant a lot to him personally and why he developed it and created it. I think he even talks a little about, about it in our Comic-Con podcast and book. Um, so this was not just a, you know, a job for, for Tim. This is something that really meant a lot to him. So for him to give it now to Zoe, um, you know, and staying on obviously as a consultant and helping out, um, and he's certainly not retiring. He's doing so much other oh, work, no. but he's, yeah. he wants to kind of help to spread the good word very much again, the way that Lloyd does it. Lloyd is so good about telling people what he does, how to do it, helping people out. I mean, he's probably the most accessible famous person you could possibly imagine. I mean, at a point he had to stop putting his email in all of his books because his team was getting so upset. Like the people in the office were like, all these crazy people are, but like Lloyd is just like that. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll say it, you know, his email and even phone number are not that hard to find. Um, and he will pick up. He's one of those people where he'll, and he'll talk with you. And it was one of the ways that we got close over the years. I met Lloyd when I was still in film school at USC. Um, I had a lot of friends who were a little older doing trauma stuff. And I'd pop over there. And of course, like everyone else, especially growing up in Southern California with some of the late night cable channels and stuff that we had, you know, I was watching uh, Toxic Avenger all the time and Kabuki Man and some of these other, you know, Class of Newcomb High and Surf Nazis Must Die. Um, you know, all the big ones were constantly being played on cable. You know, USA up all night, you know, Joe Bob's Briggs. Yes. You know, Ronda up all night with Ronda. I mean, come on. That, that stuff is so much fun. And a lot of that was trauma. 100%. You know, Skinamax, Skinamax, as we call it. You know? Yes, Skinamax. Absolutely. Well, no, you're absolutely yeah, right, it's, man. It's, yeah. all, it's, it's all trauma. And so I was familiar with what trauma was. And some of my friends were doing some trauma stuff. And so I'd kind of pop over. And that was when there was still a West Coast uh, office of, of trauma. There, 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 it was only a short-lived time. But uh, there was Trauma West for a minute. And so I, I popped in there and I was just amazed. I mean, it really was just so mesmerizing uh, to go in there. And, and it, it was it intoxicated you. I mean, you really could breathe and feel. And see. It's one of those places where and, and other trauma studios that I've been to and other trauma offices are, are the kind of places where they're exactly what you hope they would be. I mean, yes, there's desks and yes, there are offices, but also there's just the posters on the wall and all the crap on the floor and, and you know, the, you know, heads and things everywhere and blood and toxic Avenger stuff everywhere. I mean, they are the kind of place that you would hope it would be. And of course, everybody walking around, they all look like they're in burlesque. I mean, you can't tell who's a guy or a girl or whatever. They've all, they're all punks and, you know, lots of chains and, and, and nose rings and eye rings and God knows whatever else. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, I, I got to know Lloyd through that. I went to uh, Trauma Dance, which Lloyd for a while was doing. They actually would infiltrate Sundance every, every year and do Trauma Dance, where they would show their own trauma films, not just at the same time as Sundance, but actually in Park City, which if anybody's ever been, it's like, you know, half a block. So, you know, he wasn't just like, oh, hey, we're, we're doing trauma dance in Salt Lake City like an hour away. Like, no, he was there. They would like rent the same space every year. Uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone actually really kind of got it going because they were so upset that Cannibal the Musical, when it was still called Alfred Packard, um, uh, didn't get into Sundance. So they rented a space during Sundance at Sundance uh, and showed a film. And Lloyd was so blown away by both the film and the fact they did that that he later on did buy the film and changed the name of Cannibal the Musical, um, but also said, hey, they've got something going on. So a few years later, he started doing the same thing. And that's how Troma Dance got going. And we showed a film with Troma Dance when I was younger. Um, and uh, Lloyd really loved it. And that was great. And Lloyd and I became friendly. And then uh, around the country, I move around a lot. And Lloyd would always be like in Denver or in New York or in Austin or here or there. And we would just end up meeting up. And I mean, I'm sure he had fans everywhere and I'm sure he had friends and colleagues everywhere, but he would really give that time of he'd be in the town for like two days and he would go and hang out with some 20 year old kid 
we barely knew him. We'd go and get coffee. We'd walk around. I mean, it wasn't just like, oh, hey, how you doing? Like, no, he'd come out and hang out. And yeah, exactly. I know he does that with a lot of other people. That's the kind of person Lloyd is and why he is. I mean, we call him Uncle Lloyd. I mean, he's one of those people who gets that qualifier uh, and that denomination because he is Uncle Lloyd to so many people, Uncle Lloydy. And he just is. I mean, he is avuncular in that way. And to so many people, and some of them happen to be fucking James Gunn, you know, I mean, so, you know, or me, you know, you know the, oh, that, the opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> that's fantastic. And uh, really another testament to Lloyd and Troma. Yeah. They've had their lean times too. I mean, sometimes yes. they've stuck with a franchise and uh, you know, they, they've ended up being, you know, uh, losses as far as their release and how they initially did. And he survived. I mean, the Toxic Avenger had its apex, as you said, with the uh, maybe with the cartoon and everything, and then you know had uh, had some uh, lean years as well. And are they re have they already rebooted or are yeah, they? Yeah, it's, funny, you know, it's it's such a shame how many people don't know that it's it's already happened. It, it hasn't come out yet uh, 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 on a larger bubble, but at least since 1998. There's been different filmmakers who have come and gone, including Akiva Goldsman, who, of course, a lot of people probably know from some of the Batman movies and other, you know, Academy Award winning films later on, like Beautiful Mind. He wrote that for Ron Howard and the like. So Akiva Goldsman was involved at one point and all these different filmmakers, you know, came and went over the years and it kept almost happening. And then it went for some reason. Legendary ends up buying it just a few years ago. And they even had a few different people come through. But ultimately they got Macon Blair. Uh, he does um, I Don't Feel Safe in the World Anymore, in this place anymore. And he's also an actor in a lot of Jeff Nichols films, so movies like Blue Crush and Green Room. He's actually in Oppenheimer uh, for a little bit oh, as wow. well. He's one of the many filmmakers and famous people in that. That movie's just filled with, you know, it's got a Safdie brother in it and all these other people. But um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so Bacon Blair wrote and directed. It just opened Fantastic Fest, actually, just last month. And... Oh, wow. To, to give you an idea, it's legendary, and it's Bacon Blair, and who is the Toxic Avenger? Who could possibly be the new Toxic Avenger? Why, Peter Dinklage. Why not? So Peter Dinklage <laughs> is the Toxic Avenger, and the villain is Elijah Wood, of course. Kevin wow. Bacon somehow is in it, um, and many others. Uh, and it looks Lloyd has signed off on it. Lloyd says it's great. Um, I have not had a chance to see it yet. I had some friends at Fantastic Fest, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of waiting till I, I have a chance to see it myself. I don't really want to know too much about it. But yeah, for you know, in, in all fairness, like classic trauma style, even though trauma actually had nothing to do with the reboot. Lloyd had nothing to do with it. I mean, he's listed as executive producer. It's his character. But Macon Blair really did the thing where it's not a sequel. It's not even, um, uh, uh, you know, like a, a, like a reboot in, in a regular way. I mean, it really is it's a whole new story and a whole new way of, of doing the toxic vendor, whole new angle on it. And Lloyd's cool with that. Lloyd wanted him to kind of do his own version of Toxic Avenger. Cool. Um, little hints along the way. But yeah, the the Toxic Avenger, uh the the, the remake, the, whatever you want to call it, um, is going to be coming out um anytime now. I mean probably in the next year. And probably it would be smart for them to wait to 2024, which they'll probably do because that's also gonna be the 40th anniversary, if you can believe it, of the Toxic Avenger, which for those who might not know, um, there is not one, not two, but three sequels. There's actually a Toxic Avenger 2, 3, and 4. Uh, another one, 4, I showed to my girlfriend, and she could not stop laughing. And I actually showed her a bunch of different films uh, when she was visiting a couple of weekends ago, and that was her favorite, and I was really glad. And, and I will tell people, I just had watched it a week before. So I've now, I think I've watched Toxic Avenger 4 about three times in the last month because it is addictive. Uh, if you see one Toxic one, one Toxic Avenger film, see Toxic Avenger 4. Even if you haven't seen the first one, it's okay. And in fact, it tells you you do not need to see 2 and 3 because it says that 2 and 3 were so bad. P.S. Who says this? Stan Lee, who does the intro and the epilogue as well because, again, he and Lloyd were all good friends. Um, but uh, yeah, Toxic Avenger 4 is one to see. Although, as I tell everyone, this is true of most trauma films, but it is especially true of, of, of Toxic Avenger 4, Citizen Toxie. If you need a trigger warning, don't, this is your trigger warning. Don't see it. Don't see it. Or at least don't blame me if you see it. Because it is almost as though they made a list of all of the trigger warnings that there could ever possibly be. And they said, got that one, got that one, got that one, got that one. I mean, it is a barrage of all the things you are not supposed to say or do. Uh, granted, they did it in 2000. So it was a little bit before things got 
uh, kind of a little bit more uh, too hot to heavy. But um, it also, no, aside from just the gimmick of, wow, it's a live South Park episode practically and all the things they say and do, um, I think it's an exceptionally well-made film. It looks great. It's got a million characters. The storyline is really kooky and crazy. I don't want to give too much away, but it, it, the storyline is kind of wild and wacky. It's not your typical kind of film like that. The cameos in it, um, the stylized aspect of it, the humor is laugh out loud funny. Um, and the way the world building is incredible. Lloyd is, and, and a lot of the tro- films are very good about this because many trauma films have like, you know, these huge casts and there's so many different things coming on and so many different set pieces and explosions of people getting killed and monsters. And there's so much that happen and ever and happens in each trauma film, especially the ones that Lloyd personally directs. And Citizen Toxie to me is the one that is just such a melange of everything. There's even other trauma characters that come into it and all these inside jokes. Um, but uh, the, the, the side characters, the background characters start to really develop their own storylines. Even there, it, he does kind of the Paul Verhoeven thing of uh, Robocop and uh, Starship Troopers where there's uh, kind of commercials and, and there's like a news items that come on. But the, the people who are doing the news, who are, who are presenting the news, like they start having their own little storyline, like on the TVs and such. So it's almost... Um, uh, like a Mad Magazine uh, piece, in fact, where there's oh, you look at it, look at it. There's so many things. It's not just one joke. It's just all the stuff in the background. You know, the way that people will, will pause on a Simpsons episode and that you know that the people who make the Simpsons are putting in little Easter eggs in the background. And you want to read every single book title in, in the library because even someone is actually putting funny little jokes in all the book titles. You have to zoom in on any, every Simpsons episode. That's what Lloyd does so well, and I think that they do it possibly the best in, in the fourth Toxic Avenger film. There's just so much, and it never slows down. Um, it just keeps going. You just kind of, it takes your breath away, and it just goes. And I will say this, too. For those who don't believe me about the trigger warning thing, I will say this. In the first 15 seconds alone, uh, you will know if you are if this is a movie you want to keep watching or if it's one you want to throw away and go on Twitter and complain about. Um, you, at least they let you know right away. There's there's no hiding what the movie is. So. Well, th- that's great, and and the fearlessness of of the trauma films. And yes, hey, they're exploitation films. It, it, well, I, yes, it, yes, 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 and no. I okay. mean, Tell Lloyd, me. goes, Lloyd goes back and forth with that. And actually, I will say, I had the great opportunity at one point. I'll never forget this. I got to interview. Uh, Pam Greer in person for a video for behind the scenes uh, uh, featurette that uh, Miramax is doing for a Jackie Brown um, uh, redux, uh, you know, a a new box set or something like that. She happened to be um, in the Boulder, Colorado area. I had a friend who ran the film series there. Like Miramax was coming right then. Like he just, he called me up. It's like, Matt, can you get like a crew together and come do this? Like, you'll, you know, you're like the one person I know who can get something like that, you know, going really fast. And, And we did that. And I talked with Pam Greer about it. Um, and you know, she, she felt that Roger Corman movies w- could be exploitive, but like Quinn Tarantino's films are not exploitation and the way that she was treated and that she was in Jackie Brown and that she's seen with some of his other films is not exploitation. She kind of really made that distinction in a certain way. And I think there's some people who might say that Lloyd's films are exploitive. I mean, certainly he's in some ways, yes, exploiting the crew. I mean, people are working for free, yeah, and, and that's, that's, but he's not getting any money either. I mean, that's when well. But when I what, and and feel free if there's a distinction. When I say exploitation films, I mean gratuitous as far as content, and that's okay. Yeah, and, and I know, and I know that's what you meant as well. But I think Go even on. in that regard, like I wouldn't necessarily because exploitation film. It's almost that is the gimmick. That's almost what they're pushing more yeah. than anything else and behind a lot of the as i said like with citizen toxie there's a lot of uh, social commentary going on yeah and there's and even with the other original toxic adventure sure. and many of his other films i mean he made uh this crazy horror musical comedy with huge effects it was very well done poultry guys back in 2006 i remember it um, poultry guys is incredible and really it came out of his reading eric schloss's fast food nation and yep. he and one of his daughters became vegetarians. And one of the ways that he wanted to help even further was to make a movie. And so it's, again, goofy and sick and disgusting and sexy and weird and nudity and this and that, as Poultry Guys is. And by the way, the musical sequences and the songs are incredible. 
it really is a musical and a very well done one. I mean, it's it's one of the best musicals that have ever been made, especially because of how creative and innovative they are. And almost all of it takes place at an abandoned old McDonald's that they were able to rent and get, I think, up in Buffalo or something like that. Um, so it's it all almost all takes place at the restaurant. Uh, you know, uh, just like, you know, like a Kevin Smith film or something. It's all like c- contained in this one place, but still such a great film. But yes, he is talking about um, the ills of the fast food industry and, you know, the way that they, you know, the food that they make and the processing and the chemicals and um, how unhealthy it is for people and the addictive qualities of it and the way that they push things with their commercials and for sure. kids and all that. So uh Lloyd is, uh, that's why I would say, I don't know if I would necessarily call them exploitation films. They just are no budget. They're just low budget. They're just very DIY. And just as I, I, you know, there's certain other no budget or low budget films that we consider masterpieces, wouldn't necessarily call them exploitation films. Like, you know, like Lars von Trier Tom, and uh, Tom uh, Thomas Vinterberg's uh, Dogma 95 films, for example. Um, uh, or, you know, uh, certain other films like that, you know, Sean Baker, some of his films like Tangerine is a really good example where he shot most of it on the phone and, and some, some of the other films that he's done over the years. Um, you know, are they exploitation films or are they just no budget or low budget films and filmmaking? Um, and, you know, so that's really kind of the question. And, and I get what you're saying where you don't necessarily mean they're exploiting people, but just I think even the aesthetic or the, the meaning behind it, um, some people would maybe disagree with me. Lloyd has kind of gone back and forth a little bit. He has referred to the trauma films as trash, as trash cinema. And he's almost proudly to push that. But he sure. sees it in that way of it's trash cinema because it's lumpen, because it's proletarian, yes. because it is the street people. It's it just, is- like the, just like in comics and, and other pop culture art, what they call lowbrow humor, yes. you wear it as a badge. It's not, it's yeah. it's a phrase but it's not really uh, all it is is well, they have to know that it's that it has to be kind of opt in a little bit. Yeah. And that I would say is also the difference between something like what Lloyd does and someone he does not like, which is Ed Wood's films where Ed Wood's films are camp. Like Ed Wood is not self-aware Ed Wood does not really realize that right. what he's making is camp yes. or it is, you know, crap. Well, and especially Lloyd, beyond yeah. plan nine, Right. Creeping Eye or I forget, Orgy of the Damned is a really horrible. Uh, you know, the, the Bride of the Monster and, and yeah. films. Well, yeah, Bride of the Monster. And, 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 you know, look, Ed Wood, Ed Wood tried to deal with, with, with important issues too, like, uh, you know, cross dressing and such with Glenn and Glenda. Sure. Um, but even still, uh, he wasn't, he didn't realize that what he was doing wasn't very right. good. Whereas Lloyd is kind of embracing this low rung quality very much the way that it, I would again, compare it to someone like Lars von Trier when Lars von Trier was trying to do the dogma 95 films or some of the other filmmaking that he was doing films like idiot turn, for example, the idiots, which is one of my favorite films of all time, his dogma film, which was dogma number two. Um, he's purposely trying to absorb and utilize and leverage um, this, 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 this shoddily done filmmaking. What happens if we have no money? What happens if we, I mean, it really is going back to someone like Jean Dubuffet, who, you know, art brute and the idea of outsider art, where Jean Dubuffet was quite literally going to institutions and finding people that were mentally ill and, you know, helping them to create art or, 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 or seeking down people who are making art already in these institutions. Um, and then that becomes things like folk art, for example, where you're finding these people who have no education, they have no sure. idea who Van Gogh is, but they're making this very interesting, unique artwork, you know, uh, out in the boonies somewhere. And that yeah. became very hot in the 80s and early 90s as well. Um, you know, and there's a lot of playfulness there in someone like Jean, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, going back to someone like Warhol, where he was kind of utilizing that aesthetic, the aesthetic of the outsider art and art brute, and and kind of this what he would call ignorant art, and kind of almost purposely making it seem like he didn't know what he was doing. When in fact, very much like Lloyd, very much like Andy Warhol, Jean-Michel Basquiat was incredibly well educated. Um, you know, he didn't exactly uh, you know do the conventional schooling pathway because he was always getting kicked out and whatnot, but he read a lot and he was constantly going to all these different museums and art galleries. And like, so John Michel Basquiat very much knew at a very young age what he was doing. He knew what Guernica was, he knew who Picasso was, and yet he was making artwork that purposely was kind of embracing um, this kind of lowbrow or outsider art quality. And that's a lot of what Lloyd does and what Lloyd right. is doing. 
and and to really he's even said he wants to show the seams he wants to show yes this is fake this is obviously uh, a cantaloupe not a head that we're smashing with a hammer sure he he wants that split second of you actually seeing it so that a he's kind of playing with in a very brechtian way this is bartel brecht he's talked about it too it's a way of we're showing uh, how hard we're working. We're showing our blood, sweat, and tears. We're showing that this is a crew of people not getting paid. There is this meta aspect, breaking the fourth wall quality. Lloyd has talked about Brecht a lot. And again, Warhol does the same thing. And Lloyd is very influenced by Warhol, where we're going to show those moments of the actor suddenly you know, is on the screen and says, Andy, I'm hungry. I want to go. Are we done yet? And Andy edits that in. He keeps it in. You know, uh, we've talked in the past about Brian Wilson and the monkeys and things like that. And there's a lot of that in some of what the monkeys did. Certainly. And what Brian Wilson does. I mean, even on some of the Beach Boys songs, even the more poppy ones, there's little tricks and toys that, you know, Brian would leave on something, you know, one of the engineers saying something on one of the, uh, you know, more famous songs and things like that. I mean, that was Brian Wilson wants to kind of show what he's doing while he's doing it and to kind of embrace the like, hey, I'm just playing here. I'm just having a good time. This shit might be in reverse. You know, this might be this, this might be that. I mean, they're, they're, they're having some fun with it and showing what they're doing to the audience, both to, to have that connection, but also a little bit of inspiration. Look how we did it. You can do this too. You know, inspire people who want to do it. That's a lot of what Brian Wilson, Andy Warhol, Brecht, and now Lloyd Austin does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. Are there, uh, are there other projects you've got coming up that you want to talk about as we wrap up here? Yeah, um, definitely probably a good time to wrap up. Um, I hope my girlfriend stuck through the whole thing. I guess I'll find out in a moment. Um, uh, so uh, we'll see, because I, I got to have some audience members in there. But uh, no, I um, I uh, I have a graphic novel coming out with Rick Geary, um, who um, actually did the very first logo for Comic-Con um, and does these really great historical uh, graphic novels, usually about Victorian serial killers and things like that. So Jack the Ripper and Liz Borden um, and things of that nature. So Rick, uh, he just finished the 90 pages, beautiful drawings of um, an adaptation of a novella of mine from when I was younger called Daisy Goes to the Moon. Fanagraph will be putting that again out again soon. I don't have a release date for it yet, hopefully sometime in the next year or so. Um, but yeah, Rick Geary and I have that coming out, Daisy Goes to the Moon, the graphic novel. Of course, the Lloyd Kaufman book, which will be called Lloyd Kaufman Interviews. That'll be coming out through University Press in Mississippi. Again, not really sure when that's happening. Um, and then a few other projects, as always, that we're, we're always developing and working on. Um, you know, still trying to help to sell the story of, of Comic-Con with, you know, I did See You at San Diego and the podcast that's available free everywhere. Comic-Con begins. You know, we do have some other avenues we're trying to take with that, where to go next. And there's some development happening there. Good. Uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, a few other things that uh, I'm always happy to come back on the show and talk about as we get closer to yeah, those man. projects happening. Um, and we, you know, there's there's some discussion. Um, some folks are familiar are aware of the fact I'm doing this book and, and stories of Lloyd. So we've actually had some discussions about maybe getting going with some some you know projects going about Lloyd's story and the story of trauma, which has been told in different ways before, but not really in kind of a much more um, kind of you know upper crust way of, of a full length you know, real, well, professionally made uh, documentary or uh, other ways that we can do it, podcasts or whatnot, to really tell the story of Lloyd in that larger way, uh, especially as that, you know, he's getting on in years. And so it's getting to be time to do that. So 100%, man. No, this is a great uh, filmmaker and producer uh, that has uh, contributed a lot to the culture. And again, um, I think uh, I, I, I sometimes worry about this white glove clutching at our pearls uh, right. current culture that frowns on. And that's why I started to say about exploitation. It's like, yeah. listen, if you're, if, if that upsets you, you shouldn't be watching word balloon. Right. Because, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause no, I, I celebrate this stuff yeah. in the best way because I understand I'm in on a joke too, just like yeah. Lloyd is and like yeah. his audience is. So yeah. no, I'm really glad that you mentioned a lot of these great movies. Uh, I will promote Surf Nazis Must Die. <laughs> yeah, Mother's Day, Mother's Day. Mother's, Mother's Day, I, I, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to zoom in for you. Citizen Talks is great. Citizen Talks is great. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, man. And, uh, and Citizen, God, I got to... Citizen Talks is great, but Mother's Day is probably my favorite trauma film. And Lloyd knows it, even though it's not one of the ones that he wrote and directed. His brother Charles did. Um, but I love Mother's Day. And I will say, actually, there was a reboot, remake, whatever you want to call it again, kind of different, of Mother's Day that came out in 2010, where Rebecca De Mornay actually plays the mother this time. And it is quite different, but 
I will. It's pretty good. I like. It's different, but it's kind of like The Shining. Like I love Stephen King's book, but I also love Kubrick's movie. They're quite different, but you can follow both. I do like the the new. You know, even though it's 2010 now, the new version of Mother's Day. Also, I would also recommend. They're both great, but see see the original because the original is amazing. It has. I would say this, the best opening sequence, definitely of any horror film, maybe of, of any almost any film I've ever seen. It has an incredible opening sequence that I absolutely, absolutely love on every in, in every way. The way it looks, the music, the acting, the cast, just it and and where it goes, it's an incredible opening sequence. You you can watch the first 15 or 20 minutes or so of Mother's Day and you'll be in. I, 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 no way, no way anybody couldn't be. It's so good. It's so well, good. I, I'm glad that we mentioned uh, the streaming service, Troma Now. Yeah, Troma Now. And Lloyd does have, you know, like I say, you know, we're, we're working to help tell Lloyd's story and Troma's story in these later years, but Lloyd's books are fantastic. And I would highly recommend to anybody who wants to know about filmmaking, to anybody who's curious about Lloyd or Troma films or just films, the independent films in general, um, how they're made, um uh how they get out there how they're sold read everything i ever I, I everything i know about filmmaking i learned from the toxic avenger and he actually co-wrote it with james gunn it was one of the projects that james did work on with Lloyd. um so and and for those who, who keep wondering about the james gunn connection james did start at trauma early on he helped to uh write and produce uh tromeo and juliet which was one of the films that really got Troma to kind of come back, as you were saying, John, there was sort of sort of a lean period and Troma kind of came back in 96 with Troma and Juliet. Really, you know, again, that next generation now yeah. started to get into Troma because of the success, both critically and commercially. It wasn't just commercially. Critically, I mean, the critics loved it. The New York Times, I mean, it got rave reviews. It's one of the reasons that James Gunn really got going because after this, he writes Scooby-Doo and he does a few of these other projects. And then all of a sudden, sure. he gets, you know, start making well, these other films. You can see the through line from Tromeo and Juliet to super. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, this, right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and that's, I mean, yeah. really everyone needs to see uh super, especially in anticipation of what he might do with the DC cinematic universe as well, the Kevin Feige. He's always doing that kind of story. Cause even after super, he does the specials. And that's the right. Is similar, and he—it's almost like he's building two Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. And into this idea of because the specials has a very similar kind of storyline too. Of it's yep. you know they're the fifth best you know superhero team. They're not the first. They're not the second. They're the no, fifth. it's rich, it's they rich, are, rich yeah, superheroes they, just yeah, like Suicide are, Squad and the Guardians. The losers of the, of the superhero world. Yes. And that yes. is so James Gunn's Mitier. Yes. I mean, that is where that's that's his community and what the story he loves to tell, even now with his his huge billion dollar franchise movies. Yeah. Um, and he gets a lot of that. I mean, he obviously had some of that before when he was younger, but he gets a lot of that from Troma and from Lloyd. Totally agree. And because of that, you know, some people might know this. Lloyd is actually in the background of the Guardians of the Galaxy films. And and James would shut the production down and be like, hey, everybody, Lloyd Kaufman's here. You know, Lloyd is why I'm here. Lloyd's why we're all here. I mean, he really did. And Trey Parker and Matt Stone, same thing. I mean, they actually, even after South Park and even after they got a lot of their success, they c came back and did this ridiculously humiliating D now mod or tag really at the end of Terra Firmer, uh, where they're playing uh, these really kooky characters. And that was after South Park had already happened and become a success and whatnot. So, you know, Lloyd has these people that really champion him. Um, and you know, some of them have grown up to be these huge filmmakers, um, you know, and, and then the ones even who didn't start with trauma, but were inspired by trauma, Quentin Tarantino, Peter Jackson. Um, there's so many different people who are very much inspired by what trauma does and what Lloyd does, even if they weren't involved in trauma and maybe they wanted to, they wanted to, um, you know, be involved with trauma, but they just couldn't for whatever reason. So now they're, they're fans of trauma, um, as these full grown, you know, filmmakers and so forth. So, you know, it's Thank really fun. But yeah, so uh, and and anybody can uh, who's interested in my other projects or the Comic Con book or other projects like that, um, you know, of course, can go to my website www.matthewclickstein.com. It is spelled with one T. Uh, Matthew is um, so, and there's plenty of of good stuff there as well. Um, and yeah, anyone who's interested in Lloyd Kaufman, he does pop up in a lot of my other projects. I always bring him in, and he is interviewed in the Comic Con book, and he's in a few other things that I've done over the years as well. That's great, man. And uh, yes, I'll point to. Uh, a lot of other uh, um, of Matt's books, like his history of Nickelodeon, the wonderful book he co-wrote with Mike Reese about um, the Simpsons history, 
And uh, yeah, and of course, uh, you are obsolete from Aftershock, a great uh, miniseries that, that matter. Well, I'm looking forward to the Rick Gary uh, project, man. Yeah, yeah the Rick Gary book, book, it's beautiful. It's really gorgeous. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And again, for those who don't know, Rick Gary is another one who is a legend. And, you know, people who know, know Guillermo del Toro is a huge fan. Um, uh, and the people who don't should know. And I'm hoping a book like this, too. And I think, uh, and, and I think Gary agrees with me. Gary Groth over at Fanographics, of course, agree. I think we this is time to really push the book as kind of you know. In case you don't know who Rick Geary is, um, you know, here's here's something a bit different than what he normally does, and working with another person in this way. But I'm hoping that we can really push Rick the way that I like to push Lloyd with these projects I'm doing, or some of the other people with Comic Con, including Rick, who's in the Comic Con book, um, or Mike Reese with the Simpsons book. You know, I love doing these projects where. Not only I get to work with these really great people, but especially people like Rick Geary, who's not just an amazing artist, he's also an amazing person. He's one of those people, I, I've never heard anybody say anything negative about Rick, and I can't imagine anybody ever saying anything negative about Rick. He is the sweetest, and he's this like, just this puckish pixie of a man. He's so just, he's like a guru. I mean, I can't imagine him ever getting mad, and I can't imagine anybody ever getting mad at him. And so I really want to do what I can while we're going through this process to, to say, hey, hey, look, Rick Geary's back. Or, hey, look at what, you know, hey, fans of Rick, check this out, what he can do. And for people who don't know, I really want people to say, oh, who is this guy? And then like, yeah, no, you, you got to check this out. This, this, you got to know who this guy is and you should get his other books and whatnot. Um, you know, look, the clock's running out on everybody. You know, time moves on, whether we like it or not. You know, as Dorothy Parker would say, uh, you know, oh, flit, time is, uh, oh, shit, time is flit. Um, and so, uh, you know, we got to go with that. And so this is the time to really give people like Lloyd Kaufman, give people like Rick Geary and some of the other people I've worked with over the years, uh, their due because they all have fans and they're all legends in their own way, but there are more people who could and should know about these people. Trina Robbins, as we were talking about, look, there are people who very much know who Trina Robbins is, but I think there can be more. And I think that, you know, these larger mainstream worlds and documentaries that come out and TV shows and all these different things that happen now um, and discussions need to include people like this because they're so important. And I'm just doing what I can to help tell these stories. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I've been very lucky. These people end up being really cool. We become good friends. Um, you know, there is that one, one time out of 10 every now and then where you meet an asshole, but you know, they're there too. So uh, I'm, sure you've met, I'm sure you've met one or two, John, you know, uh, no, absolutely. But again, once or twice. <laughs> this is, this is where we have this common interest and pursuit of yeah. uh, exposing younger generations to the cool shit that we grew up with. Even the yeah. things a couple generations before our time, we know that it's great and it's great to be able to introduce it to younger audiences. And that's why I appreciate a lot of these histories that uh, that you're involved with. And the Lloyd Kaufman project is going to be great. And I can't wait to read it. Um, and yeah, maybe when it's time uh, and everything, uh, maybe we can convince Lloyd to yeah, come well, it happen sometime in the next two or three years, but we'll see. Well, it's maybe, University Press. They've been great. Maybe, I really love them, but you know. Oh, I understand. Weird. And and believe me, I, I understand the publishing world. Yeah. Maybe sooner than later than uh, much like Trina, uh, you can help me convince Lloyd to come on board, Balloon, to be great. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell Lloyd. I'll just be like, hey, Lloyd, you're going to do John's show next week. Yeah, no, Lloyd would love to do it. Yeah. That'd yeah, be great. Had, well, I'm sure he tweeted this out, and, and I think some people knew about it through through Lloyd pushing it. I texted him this morning, and so he said he'd love to help. Lloyd, I mean, That's Lloyd's great. great about that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I appreciate it, Matt, as always. And uh, stay in touch as you do, and uh, let me know when there's something new, and uh, I'll have you back because there's – Always great stuff to talk about with Matt Clixton. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody, for listening. More great word balloon to come up. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, Halloween-themed uh, conversations before we get to the 31st. So expect that. Let, leave that as a tease. And as they firm things up, I'll let you know who's coming up. But until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.